first campus officially opened in Mona, Jamaica. Ten women and 23 men from across the Caribbean enrolled to study medicine. Later that year, through Royal Charter, the university was formally approved by the Privy Council. It has been rendered as a place of light, liberty and learning, as well as a Caribbean response to the challenge of change by Sir Philip Sherlock, the first Director of Extramural Studies, and Professor Rex Nettleford, the first UE alumnus to become Vice-Chancellor in their joint monograph documenting the university's history. 75 years ago, what began as a fledgling university campus in Jamaica has evolved into a future-driven and top-ranked global academy with five campuses across the Caribbean and global centers in North and Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. We are rich in innovations and ideas. We are powerful pelicans, ready to fly on those wings of change like never before. We are renowned for an exceptional record of producing critical thinkers and leaders who serve the needs of the 21st century society, and at 75, we're just hitting our stride. UWI's legacy is the light of stellar service and leadership in the Caribbean for seven and a half decades. A global university rooted in the Caribbean, activist, SDG engaged, climate smart and championing reparatory justice with a mission to advance learning, create knowledge and foster innovation for the positive transformation of the Caribbean and the wider world. As we mark our 75th anniversary in 2023, the UWE at 75 Jubilee supports a reflection of our past homage to the present and the future outlook. And so we have to be robust in our management. Uh, we have to be strategic in our decision making. And we have to ensure that this university uh, continues to rise and to make proud the people of, of the Caribbean. We are rooted. Although our growth and impact continues to be global, we remain strongly influenced by where our university's foundation was built and by our service to Caribbean people and their contributions to the UE's development. We are ready. We continue to be an advocate for the region, its needs and advancement, and we are recognized as a valuable resource for expertise on every issue that it faces playing an unprecedented role in enabling the Caribbean's readiness, ability to overcome challenges, to build the Caribbean's resilience, and revitalize Caribbean development. We are rising. We face head-on with realness and honesty the reality that there is still room for the university to grow. We are on a continuous path of improvement and development, and as the light rising from the west, we aspire to rise, to soar higher, and to be a beacon of empowerment to our community. Rooted, ready, rising. Join us for the 75th anniversary of the University of the West Indies. Learn more at www.uwi.edu forward slash 75. The 75th anniversary of the University 2023 will be a magnificent year. A hearty and warm and refreshing welcome to everyone this afternoon. But I beg leave to, in particular, extend a very hearty or warm-hearted welcome to our guests of honor and a member of our family, Professor Hazel Simmons MacDonald, Professor Emerita. Applied Linguistics, the UWI, and of course, our former Vice Chancellor and Principal of what was the Open Campus, now rebranded uh, the, the Global Campus. I am, of course, very delighted to be your host and moderator for this final in a series, Global Conversation. Let me recognize and to be sure that I do not omit anyone, let me recognize all members of the senior management team who are present, our heads of departments, our staff, 
our alumni, our friends, well-wishers. And of course, I cannot forget the students of Professor Hazel Simon McDonald, especially those who took classes at the foot of the piton. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, always, that always has remained um, with me. At some other session, she could tell you about those, reminisce about those. So colleagues, this is our 75th anniversary Diamond Jubilee in its closing stages. As principal of the global campus, I have to say that I am extremely pleased to be at the head of a campus that has given us a kaleidoscope of 75th anniversary celebrations across the Caribbean. If ever there was a pan-Caribbean campus, it has to be. And I say that without fear, favor, or contradiction, the global campus. The lectures have been informative, but non-formal in their tenor, and have warmed our hearts and have provided excellent information. I pay tribute to the organizers, to the, to the co-chairs of the 75th anniversary celebrations. And so, colleagues, our topic tonight is from extramural studies to an open campus. Celebrating you is 75th or 75 year journey to fulfill its vision for continuing and distance education as one of its cornerstones for regional development. And you will allow me, colleagues, to now formally introduce Hazel Simmons MacDonald. Hazel Simmons MacDonald is Professor Emerita of Applied Linguistics at the University of the West Indies. Prior to her retirement in 2014, she served as Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the Open Campus at the University of the West Indies. <clears throat> Early administrative appointments included service as Head of Department of Language, Linguistics, and Literature. Head of the Department of Linguistics, Deputy Dean of Outreach, Deputy Dean Planning, and the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education at the Keyville Campus. She also served as a co-chair of the UE Cultural Studies Initiative. Her undergraduate studies in English Honors and Deep Ed were done at the UE Mona, and her postgraduate studies, an MA in International Development Education, an MA in Linguistics and a PhD in Education were done at Stanford University. Her research interests include second language acquisition, the development of literacy by Creole and Creole-influenced vernacular speakers, and vernacular literacy within the formal education context. She served for several years as the Secretary Treasurer of the Society for Caribbean Linguistics, as its Vice President for one year, and a two year stint as President of the Society from August 2008. <laughs> Her publications include articles and book chapters on second language acquisition, vernacular literacy, language education policy, literacy development, language and culture, and open and distance learning. She has also co-edited books on Creole-influenced vernaculars in education, and she collaborates on writing French Creole instructional texts for native speakers of Antillean French Creole. She has also published several English language texts for use at secondary and tertiary levels. She, uh, she was a member of the International Council of Distance Education Standing Conference of Presidents 2008, to 2014, for which she led workshops and presented papers on lifelong learning and selected aspects of distance education. And she was an honorary advisor for the Commonwealth of Learning from 2009, 2014. In her retirement, she has done some research and in the field of specialization, and she worked occasionally as an education consultant 
on selected projects for the ECERP, CEDA, UWI, DFAT, the Legal Impact Project, the Caribbean Examinations Council, the OECS Early Literacy Project, the Earliston Teachers College Literacy Diagnostics and Early Intervention Training Program, and the Universalia Management Group Limited for the review of CDB's education policy and strategy. She now tries to devote time to her hobbies, which include creative writing, cross stitching, swimming, and gardening. She has received many awards, including the OBE Office Officer of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire in 2012 for her contribution to education. An award for outstanding contribution to education from the Global Distance Learning Awards of the World Education Congress in 2014. A Frank Collimer Literary Award for a collection of short fiction in 2018. An award for outstanding contribution to linguistics and multidisciplinary education from the UE Institute for Gender Development Studies on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the UE in 2019. She was awarded the SLC, the St. Lucia Cross, under the Order of St. Lucia in 2021. And she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences Literature and Lang Languages section and inducted into the Academy in September 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't need to say much more in terms of convincing you that Professor Hazel Simon McDonald is eminently and refreshingly qualified to address the subject from extramural studies to an open campus celebrating UE's 75 year journey to fulfill its vision for continuing and distance education as one of its cornerstones for regional development. Let us make our dear former principal feel very welcome. Over to you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much, Principal, for your very kind introduction and to the committee for inviting me to at least participate in the celebrations. I am honored to um, have been a part, to be a participant in it. Um, and I'd like to say hello to all our friends who are here. Most of you I know. And I'd like to just say hello and thank you for being here and to share this occasion with, with us. Um, I hope I can manage this whole technical thing. I'm missing Tommy, I guess, and the cat's team, but here we go. I will share my screen if you don't mind, because I have I set this up along a set of, of um slides. And um when I need to speak for any length of time, I will simply stop sharing if that's okay with you. Okay, so let's see where we go. Here we are. Can you see? So this, this is the topic. Can you see my screen? Yes? yes. Can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. Yes, we can. The topic that they, um, that, so what happens now? I can't get it to move. Good heavens. All right. So I'd like to focus this presentation um, on extramural and the journey of the university um, from those early days, 1947-48, um, when UCI was um, in at the inception of UCWI and the extramural department, right up to let's say 2000 and um, to, the, to the formation of the open campus in the first five years after the open campus came into being. So this is what I will do. So from the earliest days of its establishment as the University College of the West Indies, the UCWI, the administrators of the college expressed the wish to create an extramural department that would have the purpose of bringing the UCWI to the rest of the Caribbean. Perhaps it would have been more precise if I said they gave voice to their intention because it was more than just a wish. From its inception, 
the formation and the subsequent development of the extramural department in its very but focused manifestations over the first 60 years of it and the university's existence has been embraced as one of the pillars through which the university would be linked with Caribbean countries distant from the landed campus where it was first established and through which it would also provide opportunities for education for Caribbean citizens who could not travel to the campus to study. This is a fascinating journey. And from the records in the archives, as well as from the rel rel relatively recent publication, Breaking Down the Walls by Curtis Bernard and Suarez, we learn about the various associated agencies that were spawned, not simply to ensure the survival of the department, but also to expand its reach and the range of services it offered. In the inception phase, there was no equivocation among university college administrators and politicians about the need for the institution to have a presence in the so-called non-campus countries or the NCCs. They articulated a vision that was focused on agreed goals and unswerving intentions. A primary intention was that in realizing its existence as a regional university, its presence would need to be felt in the islands spread across the Caribbean. The extramural department was envisaged as the entity that would be a palpable manifestation of this presence. And it would not only serve to provide education programs that were needed locally, but it would also present opportunities for access to university programs. Descriptions of the purpose of this department were given by various individuals, and all of them indicate common and unwavering objectives. I'll give you some examples. One Kelly in 1950, in the 1950 publication, is reported as describing it in this way. Quote, the extramural department was built was the unit dedicated to bringing the university college to its scattered con constituents who could not come to it. Eric Williams is described as being persuaded that the university had to be brought to the people to empower them for a fuller life. And the authors of Breaking Down the Walls explain that the aim of the extramural department was to provide adult education in a systematic way to all classes and conditions of persons across the region. There was general consensus on the need to establish extramural centers in the so-called non-campus countries. These authors mention that in an important goal was to ensure that the work of the extramural department reflected, and I quote, the work and image of UCWI. They also observed that the goals which had been set by the first director of the extramural department, Sir Philip Sherlock, who served as director from 1947 to 58, seemed in their words to be, quote, quite ambitious. Nevertheless, at the time of their review and writing in the early 2000s, they reported with some degree of animation the extent to which the department had been able to implement the goals over the years, despite the fact that, quote, slender resources had been allocated initially, unquote. So let's briefly consider the program guidelines from the early years that were presented in the 1945 Irvin Report on the West Indies Committee on Higher Education in the Colonies and referenced in the, BTW, in the, in the Breaking Down the Walls. So, the guidelines were identified for three main areas, the ones, the ones you see on the slide, namely general cultural subjects, and these included the arts, languages, literature, drama, and music, as well as selected areas in the social sciences, for example, economics and public administration. The second area was devoted um, to lectures, or they advocated for the second area, lectures and lecture series that would be given by staff of the university or from further afield. And the third area specified what refresher courses for teachers, social welfare workers, and farmers. From these early years, adult education was one of the programs to which the department was asked to give attention with the view of eventually developing degree programs in this field. The committee's recommendations were that the programs offered by the department would be, quote, educational rather than vocational. In his role as director of the department, Sir Philip Sherlock, who had also been a member of the Irvine Committee Commission 
outline broad goals based on the original program outline. Now, these are the ones I think that the authors might have considered ambitious, and perhaps because they reflected complex, but nevertheless important attributes. So, for example, the goal specified first, uh, provision of assistance to men and women to, quote, understand their rights and responsibilities as citizens of the British Caribbean, also to encourage and assist them to lift their standards of thinking and living, to encourage social cohesion and to help them live in harmony by the use of methods such as group work, study of the society's history, structure, and its economy. And they, he also emphasized personal competence and leadership in various working contexts, and also inculcating good tastes and standards of excellence through promotion of, quote, objective inquiry and informed thinking, unquote. We learned that resident tutors who planned and pro pro promoted programs later on did not adhere exclusively to that stipulation of um, educational rather than vocational. They did much, much more. They focused also on developing and offering courses and programs that not only educated citizens along lines recommended in the guidelines, but they also helped them to develop skills in vocational areas. Within the period 1947 to 2000, when the status changed and it evolved into the open campus, the department was ably led by a series of directors with three serving for lengthy periods. And you probably know all of them. So Philip served from 47 to 58, Professor Nettleford from 67 to 96, and Professor Lawrence Carrington, 96 to 2007. Six other directors stood for either one year or two years in the period intervening to so Philip's tenure and that of Professor Netherford. That is from 1958 to 50 to 67. Within the broad context of the guidelines that I just referred to and that had been proposed for the department, several other functions and responsibilities were considered not just possible but essential if the department was to fulfill its role as a central pillar of the university and realize the many goals that were being articulated for it over the first three decades. Within the first two decades, staff tutors who were referred to as roving staff members were appointed to help develop academic and artistic programs in the outlying islands. The evolution of staffing in the department from roving staff tutors and staff representatives to the appointment of resident tutors was gradual. In the early period, much was achieved through cooperation between the university and governments, because budgets were not that lucrative at the time for establishment of centers across all the islands. The rooms that governments had provided to locate the department in various countries evolved eventually into more commodious accommodations in the 60s when centers were built in most of the islands. I remember when I first taught for extramural department, having just come fresh from university, um, I was teaching English in the evening for extramural, and we had to go into this room of a, a two-story building, a room over a, a bakery it was, and people would come there. And that was the room that the government had allowed for the beginning of extramural. So they moved from that kind of accommodation to centers built on land that had been um, given by the government for them, for the university to expand its operations. Resident tutors were appointed as centers. Our centers were established in outlying islands and districts, and they assumed primary responsibility for programs that were offered at the centers. The menu was as diverse as the need, and initially, before the appointment of resident tutors, the so called roving staff tutors would visit from the fixed campuses, and they were instrumental in establishing programs that became fixtures within the UCWI. We are told that they were usually based at the Mona campus. And their role was to actually go around and try to share their own academic or artistic endowments with um, people in the outlying countries. So they filled a very important niche in the early and middle years and ensured that the non-campus countries benefited to some extent from central university resources. The range of services they offered in the first three decades was, was certainly impressive, and the portion for treating conventions flexibly in a bid to respond to existing 
existential imperatives has been at the center of the UWI extramural work. And this is um, the view of the authors um, of the role of staff tutors. The resident tutors introduce programs that they perceive to be needed within the countries in which they serve. The appointment of tutors was considered to be essential, and in the words of the authors, necessary to establish a physical symbol of the university in each of the Leeward and Windward Islands. Unquote. With the establishment of the centers and with the dedicated tutors to initiate programs and improve on the physical infrastructure of centers, the UWI was further realizing its mission to have a durable presence in the countries of the region and to be instrumental in providing educational programs that would contribute to the development and enrichment of the lives of Caribbean citizens. The recommendations that were made for centers um, early on included the following. Uh, work for examination based on curricula of the university for persons who were unable to attend the campuses, non-degree courses in several subjects, for example, citizenship, Caribbean studies, creative arts and sciences, and extension work of the professional schools of the university, that is the what the faculties, the various faculties were offering agriculture, medicine, education, and engineering. In that early period, focusing on the needs of citizens in the outlying countries, the department also offered classes and programs ranging from those required for GCE examinations, like several people who could not get through secondary school, went to extramural to take um, these subjects so that they could actually get some certification to get jobs or to go higher. Vocational courses, they also offered vocational courses and selected programs from some of these areas that the university was actually offering on the campuses. In many instances, collaboration with faculty and the campuses contributed to the programs with visits from lecturers to, the visit, to deliver lectures. And further progress was made when the name of the department was changed from extramural to School of Continuing Studies in 1989. The early phase of the UWI journey, of which I'm presenting just a clip in this first part of the presentation, was marked by struggle, determination, and commitment to realize the vision and intention of a university that would not only have a presence in outlying territories, but would also be instrumental in the education it offered so that people across all class structures would access programs and special courses that would help them to improve their lot in life. It was also marked by cooperation between the university and governments, which assisted early on with providing the rules for classes. And I, I gave you an example of one of those. So classes were taught in these rooms and later they provided locations in which expanded centers, the university centers were built. In the development of this department, which we note already had been changed to School of Continuing Studies. In the work of that department over approximately five and a half decades, which preceded the establishment of the open campus, there were hints of tension and struggles which waxed and waned with the expansion of Mona and the establishment and growth of the other two landed campuses in Augustine and Cayville. The university established the Office of the University, the Office of University Services, the OUS, at Cape Hill and Mona in response to concerns and demands of governments, especially those in the OECS, who wanted UWE to enhance, on the one hand, university education in the islands, and also to put in the infrastructure to reflect this. They achieved unity, and this was strengthened by having both functioning under the director of the School of Continuing Studies, who also served on the board for non-campus countries and distance education when this was established in 1993. The forging of a relationship by resident tutors between the School of Continuing Studies and the tertiary level institutions, the TLIs, through the OUS led to several positive outcomes, including the formation of the Association of Caribbean Tertiary Institutions, which still um, holds annual um, conferences up to today, that's ACTI, and all of these led to the strengthening of the UWI in its association with other regional institutions. Over the first several decades of its existence, what is most evident and commendable is the UWI's resolve to position itself as the preeminent and dedicated leader, in effect, the cornerstone 
for making available education through distance to the people of the region. So let's consider some ways of in which it provided continuing and distance education over the years. And you would see it started broadcasting by radio, then we also had face-to-face, -face. we had online, and as the technologies improved, it gets a lot more sophisticated. So I referred earlier to units that represented milestones in the UE's journey towards providing continuing and distance education across the region. And I also mentioned the work of the staff tutors through whose work and engagement special units were created and which became important avenues for continuing an adult education within the institution. We can view these as two primary tangential parts to which the university, university offered continuing and distance education. On the one hand, the technical and technological innovations created a pathway for openness that had few, if any, boundaries. And the specialized units which emerged from the work of staff tutors became important avenues for adult and specialized education. Both of these pathways formed the foundation on which the university's concept of an open campus was realized. Let us take a quick look at the entities that were established along both of these pathways and I'll summarize some important aspects of their contribution to the distance and continuing education agenda of the UWI. So I call it modalities, but we can list the two strands for distance. Um, and this shows that the first strand sort of goes with the technology. So we had the radio education unit, REU, and then we had the challenge education experiment. We had UWI, the UWI distance teaching experiment, and UEDEC, the UE Teaching Center, that's on the one hand. And then the specialized units pushed forward by the, the staff tutors were continuing from the very inception and uh, several institutions were formed and you can see those. The Trading Wealth, Social Welfare Training Center, the Trade Union Education Institute, the Preschool Child Development Center, which gave birth to the Preschool Child Development Center, the PCDC, Human Resources Development Unit, the One Women and Development Unit. The work done and through each of these was significant and central to the development of the UWI's adult continuing and distance education programs. Excuse me, a full account of their development and contribution can be found in the archives, and a detailed description is also given in the Breaking Down the Walls history. And here I will simply give a very brief summary of salient aspects of each one so that we can see what went into um, feeding the open campus as well. So the radio education unit in 90, established in 1954, it was UE's first experiment with distance education. It presented social, political, cultural, and academic programs from the university, as well as the Department of Extramural to the Caribbean. It was a channel of adult education. It was involved in non-formal distance education. It collaborated with campus faculty and extramural resident tutors to broadcast lectures, discussions, drama, study material, to, and all of that to supplement information for extramural and other education institutions. There was important cross-campus, cross-department collaboration with UIDITE, and that was in, especially in 1978, the UIDITE Satellite Project and also with the Social Welfare Training Center project on women and development. And it served to provide access to educational information. So people would tune in and get lectures and listen to programs that helped to amplify what they had learned in the classes that were being offered. And then the UWI Challenge Education Scheme, which came about in 1977, and it was initiated in the Faculty of Social Sciences at Mona, I think by um, Dr. Fred, Fred Nunes, who was concerned that the UE was not supporting students in the NCC sufficiently. So a challenge opened doors for students to access UWI's degree programs. And the concept of challenge comes about from the idea that students who would not have the usual resources that were available on campus and for campus students would take the UWI exams under their own initiative study it themselves, find what they needed for it, and take the exam, and then try to get access to you that way. Hence the concept of challenge. So UWI, when it was convinced around 1986, 
that challenge was really popular and that it, in the in the extramural and school of continuing studies departments people were going for it it's then began to provide support because it thought it would also contribute to the success of the program at that time so you what did you we do we provided funding to the campuses to prepare materials and teaching aids that would support the challenge program and that was a very good thing because then you had the whole university contributing to that particular initiative challenge contributed to the development through training of professionals as well and others and it led to um, it led you to a great services through the exploration of technology later on so let's see what else we have here and then we had the technological aspects you have UV distance teaching experiment UVDIT which began in 1981 and had been recommended from us Study done um, by the Caribbean Regional Communications Service, and you uh, undertook that, and <clears throat> it fund it was funded by also with, by the USAID, and what it provided was a replacement of classroom lectures by audio teleconferences. There were no face to face lectures. Support was provided by print materials and tutorials, and some support was given by occasional visits from lecturers on campuses. It represented an upgrade in UE's offerings of distance education in the provision of print materials, books, and audiovisual materials. And in 1983, the challenge was subsumed under the UWI, the UWI scheme. So that, in fact, enhanced for the challenge people, what they were doing, because then they could tune into the teleconference in the UWI. Then we went on to the UWI Enterprise. Profession that provided training for faculty and development of educational materials, use of audio distance teaching and teleconferencing. And it introduced local teachers, it introduced local teachers to cook programs, um, how they should enhance delivery. So we told that in 1986, UEDITE had become a critical part of the university's operations. And we know how UEDITE morphed into UEDEC, the University Distance Teaching Center. And UEDEC is what preceded OC immediately. In 1992, there was policy justification and there were guidelines for a dual mode delivery of programs and that the RANIC reports um, um, gives a full account of that. In 1993, the Board for Distance and Education was established, and they were responsible for the planning and the implementation. And in 1996, there was funding in the form of a loan and a grant to improve the teleconference facilities and infrastructure at UWI. UEDEC was established then. Students who had access to programs, and that was possible through face-to-face, -face, via distance, or via both media. Faculty were urged to use student-centered approaches because we are told that faculty somehow didn't want to change their ways of teaching. And with this teleconferencing, um, this video conferencing, it was thought that they needed to use more student-centered approaches. And so they were given some training for that. So the teaching would become more interactive and the delivery would be more um, acceptable to students. So it was a collaborative approach. Faculties provided academic content for the courses. UEDEX dedicated staff provided curriculum development and technical support. Now the strategic plan of the university presented a mission statement for UEDEX and the aim of the center. And this was described as follows. I'll let you read that. It was that they say we should dedicate it to becoming a center of excellence in itself and as a catalyst for excellence in distance education throughout the university to developing and delivering quality programs by distance. In so doing, meeting the higher education learning needs of an ever widening population of students in order to contribute to the university's mission of unlocking the potential of the peoples of the region. Quote. Now I'm sure you will have noted that the intent of Quote, unlocking the potential of the peoples of the region, unquote, is the same as that which was articulated at the inception of UWI, UCWI. 
It also appears in statements of concern made at different times by tutors when the provision of UWI support in the outlying districts and islands seem to be waning. It is the underlying vision that remained over successive decades and which resurfaced when the university sought with renewed vigor to honor its commitment to the citizens of the NCC. The special units also emerged from a similar intention and the zeal of the staff tutors from the very first decade of UWI's existence ensured that the presence of UWI was not only recognized, but that its resources were accessed in remote islands. The work done by the tutors was voluminous and far-reaching. We learned that through the specialized units, the UWI court balanced its educational construct and introduced and developed a system of non-formal education to address adult learning in a more holistic manner, unquote. I will now present just a brief summary of the functions of and the selected milestones of these special units to indicate their achievements and the focus of their work. And it's important to say that they were all within the extramural department. They functioned within that department, if not from the beginning, but they were incorporated into the department at some point. So here we go. So just some general points relevant to all the units. They offer diverse relevant programs which had not been made available by the formal system, that's the campuses. And these programs were to extend the UV's reach to the lowest levels of the community, which the formal programs of the university could not do at the time because they would, the people with qualifications had to attend the campuses. And it is only through extramural and the center that people from communities who probably wanted to get a course could actually get access to the education. So the Social Welfare Training Center, or SWPC, in 1962 was established and it's in the Department of Extreme Work. It was built with the support of the government of Jamaica to provide for training in social services and allied subjects. Unquote. Its aim was to work with the socially disadvantaged. It provided continuing education for local and regional social workers, introduced family planning and family life education unit at SWTC, and it trained professionals and workers across the region. Then we have the region, the CCDC, that other unit, specialized unit started, we are told, as a regional preschool child development project or center. And it emerged from the expanding work of the SWTC, which was initiated by what who I call the indefatigable staff tutor. Sibyl Francis, who single-handedly really spawned a lot of these programs that grew into those specialized centers. The purpose to trans its, its purpose was to transform early childhood development in the region through the development of programs and services designed specifically to promote the total development of the young child. And that, of course, in 1975 became the regional pre preschool child development center which was a collaborative project within the extramural department between extramural, UWI, and UNICEF. And the purpose was to encourage, quote, culturally relevant child rearing practices and curriculum to promote, among other things, cognitive development, maintain a program of parent education, and to engage in research and documentation too, and to advise governments and other agencies on child development. It also developed curriculum and programs to cater to needs of gifted children and those with disabilities. And CCDC, the Child Proven Child Development Center, just grew out of that, morphed into it, and that was established in 1986. And they, that particular, the CCDC focused a lot on expanding the research program related to family life, child care, child rearing practices, parent education and it continued training in early childhood education and development. And I'm sure our colleague, Professor Julie Lee, will be able to tell you a lot more about the work that CCDC has done over the years. Then the Human Resources Development Unit, the HRDU, which also was formed from some um, programs in SWTC, and through the single efforts of Phyllis McCress and Russell working with Sybil Francis, um, she was in the Faculty of Education, but she saw a need that she tried to fill. 
one objective was to prepare a cadre of people, of, of persons who can apply modern adult education methods in the development of personnel able to manage social change effectively. And another objective was to organize training and consultation services for individuals and organizations engaged in training management, management and organization, as well as community development. And the other unit which I mentioned is the one, Women and Development, which um, in 1978 came about within the framework of the um, decade that had been established by the UN for women and to promote goals of quality development and peace. And in the, they had initial approaches under Peggy Antrobus, Antrobus described as within one, where women in development, they would take on special programs, strategies not considered they weren't considered to have made significant changes from the point of view of liberating women. And the wide strategies that came about women and development, where they worked with people in jobs already to try and help them to improve what they were doing, um, that was seen as not to work either. So from 1995 following, the unit developed what we see here as an ideological theoretical construct a framework for self-liberation and social transformation that would really help to create better conditions for women. And it also provided an under, understanding of, the, of, of women's lives, of women would understand their lives better. And that went beyond the simple concepts of integration and social equality. The Office of WAND is the only one that is located in Barbados. And that's because a lot of work was being done in the Eastern Caribbean. And um, Dr. Suarez did work of considerable work in St. Vincent, and these are all um, in the archives and very interesting to read those studies. And then the final one is the Trade Union Education Institute or the TUEI. Um, this was in existence from early, from 1963. And it was established because through collaboration with, um, between the UCWI, Extra Mural Department and Jamaica labor movement. Jamaica seems to have been doing a lot of work with labor. And then they wanted to, they thought that much more could be done with respect to training. And so they offered to have a building put up on, on, um, at the university for this purpose. And the purpose of the building would be to provide training and conduct research in labor education. Also, they thought to provide training in democratic trade union leadership for trade union personnel both at man management level in Jamaica and across the Eastern Caribbean. And they offer courses, courses to which people from the Eastern Caribbean and other parts of the Caribbean go to the SWTC to, to follow. So you can see that they had, they were touching different bases in communities across the Eastern Caribbean and across communities also in Jamaica and in the, um, in Trinidad and um, some of the Leeward Islands, so that they have really contributed considerably to the foundation of um, trying to educate people within the region. And what I have presented to you really is a truncated view, what I presented on PowerPoint, of the extramural department with its various units comprising the technical components, the school of continuing study, and specialized units. But this gives us an idea of the range, the reach, and the influence that the new WI, the extra department, and the School of Continuing Studies have, not only in the non campus countries, but also in outlying districts of the islands with landed campuses. Example, Trinidad and, J and Jamaica have several centers across the islands where extramural offers programs to this day. The need for the for non-formal adult education approaches provided by the school was evident, even in those districts across the islands, because there was significant growth and expansion in Jamaica and Trinidad in particular, where the school established several sites to provide educational opportunities for citizens in communities who were unable to access classes at the main campuses on those islands, or didn't have quality, yet have the qualification for entry into the formal open campus system. In the 60 years of its existence in 2007, before another significant stage in the evolution of the school to an open campus came into effect, 
The School of Continuing Studies had established sites in 17 English-speaking countries across the region. The foundation work was solid, and the UWI had demonstrated its ability, albeit with limited resources, to locate the university in communities in which its services were needed. It contributed to the development of citizens across the various social strata. The administration was of the view that the time had come for the School of Continuing Studies to evolve into a more cohesive structure. And the UWI administration at the time, with Professor Nigel Harris in the post of Vice Chancellor, announced that the university's intention, the university had the intention of forming the open campus. The task of presenting this proposal to members of academic boards and campuses fell to the pro vice chancellor of the School of Continuing Studies, who was in office at the time, Professor Lawrence Farrington. In his introduction to the book Breaking Down the Walls, he describes the advent of the open campus in this way. 60 years, he says, after the founding of the school and of the university, the School of Continuing Studies and its congeners, the Tertiary Level Institutions Unit, and the Distance Education Center will become the base for a new initiative, the creation of an open campus of the University of the West Indies. The new campus will devote its attention to communities beyond our three geographically bound campuses of Cable, Mona, and Center. And he continued, this is the ultimate homage to the spirit of continuing education. The School of Continuing Studies is about to undergo a further transformation in its quest to reach the many inheritors of our Caribbean experience, whose location or life circumstances exclude them from traditional campus environments. More than this, the reach of the new campus was not limited to the confines of the Caribbean region. With the upgrading of its technological systems in the learning centers at the hubs on three landed campuses, and with planning for the exp expansion and improvement of computer laboratories and video conferencing centers at the sites, access to the programs of the open campus online would be available beyond the region. Sorry. So the open campus launch was launched on July 4th, 2008, and it was dubbed the campus for the times and a campus for the future. And this was the logo that was st it started with, but then the University Registrar insisted that it had to fall in line with the others and use the, the logo that other campuses were using. So we have this one for memory, and we have this one for going global as well. Isn't that nice? The new campus was launched, as I said, in the 60th year of the university at the Council of Caribbean Heads of Government annual, general, annual meeting in Antigua and Barbuda. And it was considered to be a campus that would contribute to the development of human capital of the region and to the transformation and enhancement of Caribbean society. As you will observe in the organizational charts that I'm going to show you for a moment, you will see that all of the foundation elements of the school were incorporated into the open campus with the intention that the work that had been spearheaded by the non-formal and adult and adult education arts would continue to be expanded at the local open campus site. And that this source of income would be improved as the needs of citizens in remote communities continued to be met. At the same time, the specialized units would also have more ready opportunities for collaboration with directors across departments to improve the menu of offerings and get support for curriculum development. It was designed along lines of existing campuses, because that was the order of the university, but with some differences to reflect a special mission. So faculty units that are led by heads, normally in landed campuses, were renamed divisions in the open campus. Deans on, of faculties were remained directors of divisions in the open campus. In order to maintain the building blocks that had been established by the pioneers of the extramural department, Special divisions were created to accommodate the centers in outlying districts and islands and the specialized units that had done such tremendous work in reaching those most in need and creating programs catered to provide them with self-determination and to uplift their circumstances. Now, these are examples of, of cornerstone. I'm just going to show you them separately. Um, the OCCS is one. 
And so that by the end of its five years of existence, Open Campus continued to provide service through OCCS to 17 Caribbean countries. And it had 44 centers across the Caribbean with multiple sites in Jamaica and Trinidad and single sites in the Eastern Caribbean and in some of the Leeward Islands and one in the Bahamas. The specialized units, consortium for social development and research was led also by a director, equivalent of Dean. And there were heads of units in that consortium. So the specialized units were brought together there. So you had CCDC head, SWTC, HLSTVI1, and HRDU. And um, they came into the open campus. I have asterisk next to HRDU because it could not have been opened immediately when the open campus was formed because Bruce McPherson Russell, who was the sole person driving this HRDU um, work, she died soon after. But I had promised her that we would try, we would certainly keep HRDU. And so it's on the list within CSDR for implementation. I guess the campus will be doing that when that is appropriate. It's probably done it already. So they were within a division, all of them, with heads continuing to lead each division and continuing the adult education and special programming that they were known for. The Trade Union Education Institute retained the dedication of it was dedicated, it, it, HRD, no, sorry, HLSTUEI. It had been called, named after Hugh Lawson Scherer before the Open Campus was formed, and it retained that, so it's dedicated to. The campus also introduced two special units, which would further develop and drive the work that it was created for. So you had an academic and programming delivery, APAD, which had a direct so, what, and, and then heads of program planning, the head of course development, head of program delivery, support staff, all with specialized functions. They would have responsibility for working with faculty on the six campuses to develop courses for online delivery. They also had the remit of curriculum development for both online and face-to-face -face delivery if this was needed by OCE countryside. After had needed support staff, with expertise in curriculum development, multimedia, instructional development, and a range of other areas for the provision of a seamless delivery of the production and delivery of online programs and providing 24 seven support for students registered for online courses. The second very important department was the Computing and Technology, Technology Services Division, CATS. They like that name because the name of cats, you know, it gave them the image of them prowling around all this technology and providing answers to all our bewilderment of what, what we should be doing. So cats, which was led by a chief of information officer who worked with the staff in the information technology, the IT Academy, this staff comprised a group of young, technically savvy and committed adults, young adults who were born into the technologically advanced age and seemed to know everything there was to know about it. So apart from these special areas, the OP had four administrative divisions, similar to those at campuses, for example, a registry to manage operations in the campus. Campus also tried to expand all the work that was being done in the countryside and the special units by introducing within the portfolio of the deputy principal a prior learning assessment and recognition function that would enable those who may not have had the academic qualifications, but who had taken some courses and experience, or had worked a work experience to be evaluated for admission to register for courses that would open pathways for them to take scaffolding courses that would prepare them for degree programs in any of the campuses later on. So during the first five years of its existence, the OC had begun to refurbish video conferencing facilities in the learning centers at the fixed campuses and also at several sites to facilitate video conferencing and full participation of students in lectures delivered online and in discussion groups. It had obtained a grant of 20 million Canadian dollars for the purpose of one, program development, technical, technological upgrades, and institutional strengthening. TEDA, or the FACD, as it was named at the time, agreed to consider the campus's original request of a grant of Canadian 78 million 
In distinct portions, they said 20 million to facilitate approval at the highest level. If it was higher, they would the higher people wouldn't approve it. So the first grant was approved for 20 million. And it was allocated in the fourth year of the campus for the purpose of strengthening distance education in the Caribbean, or we call it SDEC. These images give you an idea of the, some of the infrastructural and technological upgrades that were done at centers and selected sites. So for example, Mandeville site was done over and here the learning center at Cahill was also done. The open campus faced challenges within its internal structure and with other campuses. Although the formation of the campus brought together the outreach units in a cohesive structure that had existed for the first 60 years of UWI as individual entities, and they were loosely connected to the UWI Center in the Atlantic campuses. Tutors were able to forge collaboration for various purposes on the basis of negotiation with deans of faculties. However, within the open campus, tensions sometimes developed between some directors and divisions with respect to matters of programming and meeting the needs of face-to-face -face students and those take, um, having taking courses online. So for example, if I take an arbitrary year, um, in which our enrollment was 25,337 with only 6,181 taking courses online and 19,156 taking face-to-face -face courses across the sites. Um, the need to meet the requirement of both groups in a timely manner um, resulted in some anxiety. In its early years, the OCA attempted to build a team spirit by organizing workshops and activities to promote interdivisional and interdepartmental synergy and stressing that the mission and success of the OC depended on interdivisional collaboration. In conceptualizing the open campus, the UWI administration, as the vice chancellor and his executive, had a vision for a single virtual, uni virtual university space, or the SVUS, which would require collaboration between the campuses and the OC. As the campus designated to manage the courses to be delivered virtually for o UWI, one of the aims of the OC was to develop a one look, one field, top quality course that would be delivered to learners in the region and beyond. Guidelines were that the content would be prepared by faculty collaborating with each other as needed, and the OC would provide assistance with curriculum development, training, for online, de de online delivery, and provide 24 7 support for learners. The proposal was that there would be a cost and income sharing between faculties in question and the OC. So that all engaged in the enterprise would benefit. There was from the start some resistance by faculties and six campuses because they had already produced some online courses and were developing their own ODL programs. The UWI administration organized cross-campus committee to craft the procedures for the development and delivery of online programs, and this had been approved by the F and GPC or Finance and General Purposes Committee. However, the unification between the campuses for the delivery of carefully tailored online courses through the open campus did not materialize. It had seemed obvious that one look, one field, top quality course channeled by a central UE mechanism would have obviated the confusion that sometimes occurred, where two courses from two different campuses with the same code and title but with different content would appear as a UE course on the market. The collaboration to prepare the one look high quality UE version with input from faculty who wish to present the course and deliver it with support offered by the OC would have been beneficial, I think, to the UV generally. It also seemed obvious that the development of the one UV ODL department in the open campus with support in the ways determined by the committee's guidelines would have eliminated the duplication of ODL departments and resources on each campus, and this would have been cost saving for the UWI. As I thought about this, the metaphor of synchronized swimming seemed to represent the UV movement towards, on the one hand, either unity and triumph as a leader in open and online delivery, or on the other hand, falling away, resulting in splintering and diminishing the resources. As happens in synchronized swimming, when all the swimmers perform in unison, the team achieves symmetry and success and the possibility of a medal in a competition. However, if one or two of the swimmers are either slow to raise an arm or a leg or to dive in unison with the others, or if perchance a non-swimmer decides to upset the choreography of the performance, as this um, big dino is doing here, then the goal towards getting a medal for unified and clear articulation becomes distant if not impossible. In retrospect, I have wondered whether there may have been absence of a unified vision and mission 
that may have affected the propulsion of the entire university towards its goal of being a formidable international contender in the realm of open and distance learning. The principles of open education on which the campus was formed were based on the reality of the region, which made both online and face-to-face -face delivery a necessity in our dispersed environment. The foundation for supporting education simultaneously through lifelong learning, which includes strategies for adult education and the implementation of andragogical methods, non-formal strategies, and access to the more formal offerings of UE had been established by the earlier School of Continuing Studies, and that needed to be continued. It does this at the same time, especially as so many in our communities are experiencing deleterious effects from two-year COVID lockdowns. Am I right? Yes. While the original vision that realized the evolution of extramural to an open campus poised the UWI to open doors wider to an international market, the course of events have not unfolded in this way, but perhaps the move to name it a global campus may produce desired effects. I read a report written by an open campus governance task force established in 2016, in which the committee presented a brief review of the open campus performance in its first eight years that would have given some assurance to the pioneering staff of the School of Continuing Studies in the Extramural Department and the OC staff as well, that their hard work had produced some beneficial results. This is what the statement said. The open campus is brought to relatively underserved communities a coherent UWI presence with a more streamlined and integrated service provision, which has included enhanced continuing education and online offerings with improved support for students studying at a distance. The open campus has extended the intellectual presence of the UWI by building UWI's brand presence in these communities, strengthening ties with existing partners and building new ones. Not only has there been an increase in the number of students graduating from the UWI 14 countries, but these individuals speak eloquently to the sense of community they have experienced as youth students of the, U of the open campus. One of the goals of the administration that had mandated the formation of the open campus was that it would not only have built UE's brand within the region, but with the synchronized collaboration of all its campuses, the brand would have achieved the international recognition that the pioneers of UCWI imagined it could have done some 75 years ago. The task force presented some recommendations in the document, and one in particular caught my attention. It's one that appears to minimize the keen competitiveness that upended the UE objective to have a single virtual university space. The task force committee presented two sets of images and recommended the second, sorry, it recommended the second as the set that would better represent the UWI generally. So you see the first set speaks of Cayville, Barbados, Mona, Jamaica, St. Augustine, Trinidad, Jamaica, and Open Campus. They're saying that the second one stresses UWI, UWI Cayville, UWI Mona, UWI St. Augustine, and for open campus, they have UWI Open Caribbean and World. So this seems to emphasize the role of the open campus as open to the world. But after reading it, I'm still uncertain as to whether the suggested emphasis provides a solution. Perhaps over the next 75 years, history will reveal the ways in which the UWI solved the ODL issue to give the UWI international recognition as a formidable ODL provider. Now that there are five campuses, the last one having been established alongside a large open campus site, I'm supposing that perhaps this fifth campus will also require finances to set up yet another open and distance learning department. Will those who are alive in 75 years hence be wondering, as I am now, whether there will then be 17 UWI campuses in the region or producing their own versions of ODL courses? Will they be wondering whether the open campus now renamed the global campus will no longer continue to direct its energies to be a force in transforming the communities and youth of the region and to uplift their lives, as a pioneer said in that first decade of UCWI? Will it have modified that concept of openness on which it was established so that it may be considered 75 years hence to be no longer open? Perhaps the success of the open campus, even with its new global nomenclature, may rest on the laurels of the achievement of the stalwarts of the extramural department and the School of Continuing Studies, 
by continuing to focus some of its energies on community side development to promote, provide a menu of courses that will better prepare younger, younger generations to become adept at managing the challenges that now seem to appear on a daily basis. Those emerging from digital technologies and artificial intelligence are instant and complex. Perhaps by then, or perhaps even now, the campus will have found a way to develop a full degree in adult education, which the pioneers of the extramural department had hoped would be a reality one day. Perhaps too, UWI will be referring to a global open campus that will have found a way to structure its operations in such a way that dependence on government subventions will no longer be necessary and it would have expanded its site operations to create the financial base that allows it to look forward to brighter horizons than seem possible at present. Thank you. I will stop sharing my screen now. Well, Prince thank Paul? you. Thank you so much, um, Prof. Hazel Simmons MacDonald for this very thorough, well thought out, well researched, as is your wont, and very in-depth history and trajectory of the predecessors of the open campus, and of course, um, now called the global campus. I think this is, and this was quite an education um, for us. Before I go any further, Prof, I I would like to, and I am thinking that the Ion Harris I am seeing in the list of participants is our vice, former vice chancellor, E. Nigel Harris. So, and, and assuming it is him, I, I, I want on all our behalfs to extend a warm and special um, welcome um, to him. You did mention his name in your presentation, and, and he presided over the uh, university at the time of the formation of the Open Campus. I had the pleasure, of course, of meeting him a few days ago, after I think about a decade. So uh, welcome, uh, Prof. Harris. Uh, thank you. Yes. So um, colleagues, we have been given quite a lot of food for thought. I, I think to use my often um, a frequented term, I, I think Prof has ruminated verbally for us and she ended with some uh, reflections which are, uh, I suppose, some sort of questions and interrogations that we can, as present staff of the global campus, can reflect upon. At this time, I want to invite anyone of you to raise any question, make any comments, um, inquire of uh, Professor Simon McDonald in terms of what you have heard um, this evening. But before you do so, I, I want us to use our technology. And of course, you could open your mics to um, warmly applaud uh, Professor Simon yeah. for her contribution. Yeah. Yes, so, so thank you very much. So colleagues, the, the, the floor is open. Yes. Um, so I'm looking down my participants list to see whether there's anyone who is going to uh, open the batting as it will. Yes. And oh, good. Yes. Ah, Dr. Nicole Philip Dow. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Professor Simmons McDonald, I want to say a very, very special thank you for acquiescing to our request and closing off our global conversations with such an enlightening lecture. Um, I sat there and I was very tempted to start making notes um, 
uh, because it was such such an enlightening journey. Um, sometimes you join um, an organization and there's so many gaps, so many things that you're not sure about, but it was really very enlightening and it really did show a lot of how we came to be. And the questions you asked at the end uh, are thought provoking. Um, it's it's food for thought for us to think about in terms of our way forward and the things we would want to do um, to make this global campus what we would really like it to be. So I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. Thanks again. Thank you for inviting. Thank you very much for for this intervention, and Dr. Nicole Philip Dow. Um, if if I should ask a question, um, Rob. And I listened throughout, you know, that trajectory where we started the, the aims, what the extramural department beyond the walls of the, the fixed campuses was supposed to do for the, for the region. And, and I summarized it in terms of building a citizenry, building civic-minded people, yeah. you know? And to do that, you had to get into the hamlets, the villages, the towns. We couldn't mm -hmm. stay in the ivory tower and do this. But I want to ask, um, what, what has the Open Campus and its predecessors taught to the UWI in general, to the fixed campuses? What, 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 what legacy, what has it brought? Because I, I mean, you, you dealt with the radio education units and I immediately thought of UETV, you know? And I remember former principal Luce Longs of saying that we, we raise a lot of, we, 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 we embark on a lot of initiatives and then we actually leave it and grant it to the university. Tell me, reflect for me, what are those legacies that we have taught to the rest of the university? Wait, 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 wait. Legacies that what? Open campus? I'm, I'm the, not well, 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 the predecessors, they, 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 they build up to the, to the open campus because a mm -hmm. lot of what I'm hearing is still relevant to be. What have we taught? Yeah, the well, I think they, they realize that if you're forming a university um, and you have campuses, you, you're getting the formal education there. Uh, they were concerned about the university becoming so integrated and giving service to the region to have transform, to have a transformative role. For that transformative role to happen, you would need to go into communities. So all of these staff tutors would go down to the communities and the hamlets, like you say, but they worked with governments in the different islands to begin to establish programs that would reach people to, to really try to realize those guidelines that we talked about, Sir Philip Sherlock talked about. Okay. And the reason that they didn't stick with just the educational aspect is what was being offered in the former institutions. They did that because Sir Philip said that this was an important thing, but they also thought that the vocational was extremely important to uplift people. So a significant part of the work that they did and a very important part, I think, was to go into the communities to really help to transform people by helping to provide the kinds of courses, programs, education, vocational support that they needed so that they could begin to raise their lot in life to become you know more productive as citizens and i think even more now that covid has passed through and we see so many instances of or references to crime here and there in the islands i think more than now we need those kinds of programs that educate that help to educate you and give them promise to to help avoid things like recidivism um and all of those things and it's their actual actually going into the communities to work with people that they have that effect. If we stay in the ivory tower of the campus, we will do all the wonderful things that campuses do. There's no question UV has done excellently right through the years. We've all benefited from it, you can tell. And all the programs, I mean, they proliferate they, in all areas of specialization, UV is doing well. But that corner of working with people in community that came through the extramural department. And it came from the very inception of the formation of the university. And I think at first, though, if we're going to really, as a university, have to transform our society, good to go global so that we can attract 
um, you know, help from outside where it comes from, other institutions or whatever, but important for us as a campus because don't we have to redefine what we are as an open campus given the shifts? All of these rich endowments open campus has given to us from the very inception that all of these have incorporated into the open campus. Certainly, we have to look at how we can continue that legacy because that's going to be the important legacy for the university to transform, help transform its communities and its society to make it a better place. Even as everything we do through our online university degree courses, we'll continue to go ahead and change and create the expertise needed at that level. We have to worry about how we influence and lift people there. That's not my personal view. I don't know, maybe somebody has a different view, but that's how I see it. Yeah, Th no, this this is this is wonderful. Thank you for this. And I think our staff need to hear this. Um to feel better about themselves and, and, and what they actually contribute to the region, sometimes unwittingly, but it's very important um, impact. I recognize Professor Ian Harris and then Dr. Veronica Simon. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me first thank uh, uh, Prof. Hazel. 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 Uh, uh, really informative. Uh, informative summary of the informative discussion about the history of really the University of the West Indies reaching out to the community over so much of its life. I, the, the question I wanted to ask is that, and you touched on, uh, Prof, was the concept that the open campus would be a platform on which the university, from whichever point, would be able to reach students wherever they are, across the campuses and also within the body of the open campus. But as, as you noted, there was controversy with respect to the role of the faculties and their use of the open campus resources. I have wondered, I thought that COVID, as awful as it was, provided an opportunity uh, for us to actually reach that goal because everybody was now forced uh, to utilize online learning. And I wondered, and perhaps, uh, Dr. Severin, maybe you could tell me whether or not uh, the, the COVID and subsequent period has enabled the university to better achieve that vision of, of, of teaching occurring across the campuses uh, in, as, as a single regional uh, sort of unit. You know, I, I had this concept of master teachers uh, in one campus reaching not only the other campuses, but the region and, and maybe the world. But, but that never happened in our time. But I wondered if COVID has made it uh, more a reality uh, today. Yes, um, thanks, thanks for that. And, and then of course I will ask um, Professor Simmons McDonald to zero in on that. But in terms of what you specifically asked, um, Prof, one of the, one of the intentions, as it were, of our mid-cycle reviewers, in fact, the very same team which had recommended our accreditation for the full maximum of, of seven years in 2019, had spoken about and had actually recommended that the open campus go global. And I think that was the terminology that was used at the time. And the understanding or the rationale was that its technology, its experience in terms of asynchronous online teaching and learning, as well as what I think we, 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 we do um, in certain cases, the blended learning overall, um, and of course, asynchronous is a subset of that, 
we could use this to bring all the programs of the university to the globe. And that was a recommendation that they made. Fast forward to the mid-cycle review that we had in November, they were very pleased to learn that the university had taken this seriously. And in particular, the question of the role that we had played vis-a-vis -vis the other campuses, but fundamentally, educational institutions, ministries of education across the region, and APAD was very much involved in, in, in that regard, in terms of training um, various constituents in the education sector in remote teaching. And that helped many institutions to go through the trauma without stopping, without pausing of the COVID. So Prof, the COVID really, in a sense, brought to the fore the strength of the open campus at the time. And it brought to the attention of the Caribbean that this is the way to go. And in fact, the trend, the inexorable trend towards open um, online learning and, and so on, I think that is not going to be reversed now. Okay. And I think that this COVID, although we would prefer not to have had COVID, but it really brought to the fore that particular um, strength. And I think it is on that strength that the university had determined and decided that we were going to rebrand the open into global, build that International School for Development Justice on the basis of Agenda 2030, and to Zoom these programs, no pun intended, to the world. So I think that has that COVID has helped um, in in that regard. Of course, the whole question, which I will not get into tonight, is resources to make it um, fully functional in an efficient way and the way that we have it ideally imaged in our minds. I don't know whether you want to zero in on that, um, Prof. Is it still not done? Well. You know best what happened in COVID, and I thought that, again, like you said, that the Open Campus would have had a very excellent position to channel forces out there. So the, what I don't understand quite, and I have to read up about it, is the distinction and the definition for global, or changing it to global, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what the particular concepts for open mean. That has to be carefully weighed, because several institutions are global, they exist globally. They look at cultural things and they want people to compare cultures and so on. So they have very particular programs. And they say that we're global because we have people compare things across countries, across different societies and so on. That's fine. Does the openness concept that was so carefully considered by our predecessors, that concept of openness reaching not just out there because I don't think the openness that the open camp, that concept of openness is precluded at all by no. not being global. No. It, or it is a matter of going strategy, but the important thing is that you need to make that kind of link. What I refer to as resources, you talked about resources. If the university wants to be a university, a global open campus, then that SVUS concept that the administration that formed the open campus at the beginning is essential to really catapulting the university that way so that no campus suffers from the kinds of financial deprivation. You understand what I'm saying? Because it will be definitely. actually channeling out there and it will be meeting needs. The open campus by itself, because I don't think the others can come in on your territory, you work with them to bring programs into the, the, the communities in the islands, but that's your that's the domain of the open campus, that's the strength. But you have that plus being the conduit for those open courses to the world. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. And if the university works together like synchronized swimmers, 
to conceptualize the courses that they want to offer there. Look, globally, exposing the culture of the Caribbean is one thing that could actually build a lot of support for, right? So, but it doesn't minimize the concept of openness. That's what I'm trying to say. And yes. therefore, when we talk about what we do, we have to be sure that we're not saying we are global and therefore this is all we're going to do. No, 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 no. That will be the demise. The day we do that, it will speak to the demise of the campus as a serious contributor to making the university or fulfilling the vision that these people have. And yeah. I don't want to preach, so don't ask me for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I cannot enhance what you have said, that would put me in serious risk of gilding the, the, the lily. Um, so I, I totally agree. And in fact, let me say to you that we are, we are determined, and, and not that there is a fight against it, but, but we have to be very careful um, since trends take place and sometimes catch us off guard. The concept of global should sit very seamlessly with the concept of opening. And it, exactly. should, not, it should not preclude opening. Yeah, that's what and, I'm saying. And we have to be, as staff of the global campus, um, vigilant in that regard. And we have to be guardians of open learning. Because yes. this is the foundation on which we are built. And in fact, I suspect that's the point that Dr. Simon wanted to make in a while because she has a, 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 a in, in the chat, she said, I suggest that this presentation be part of HR staff orientation seminar series so that all staff truly get a sense of the campus's evolutionary history. We need to know ourselves. We need to be self-aware and self-conscious in order to move forward. And, and one of the things that risk us in the Caribbean of being recolonized and becoming drawers of water and viewers of wood is that our history has been pushed from our schools and therefore we are rudderless. But I cannot speak for Dr. Simon. Dr. Simon, let's let's hear you. Yes, hi, good, good evening, um, everyone. Good evening, Prof. Nice to see hi, you. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Why aren't you showing um, your face? I haven't seen you in ages. Oh, no, I'm not in a fit state to show my face at the time. At this time. <laughs> I'm already in my pajamas. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, yes, and thank you, of course, for um, taking us down that memory lane. And um, I remember coming on board just the year before all of this excitement of Open Campus happened. Um, I'm looking at your your uh, your image of the synchronized swimmers, and I think you've put a finger on the thing that was a major factor in inhibiting or hobbling the open campus's ability to reach the goal of truly bringing the UE to the region, and that is the absence of a common vision among all campuses. In retrospect, what, what more do you think could have been done to ensure that internal accord prior to having moved ahead with the launching of the OC? And I'm speaking in terms of human and inter-campus relations, because we are definitely still not swimming in tandem. Well, I was a dean when Professor Carrington came around to the academic board to speak of it. And I have to be honest with you, people were not paying attention. They were not paying attention. And the, the guidelines that were, were presented, I think they missed some of them. So that when Open Campus was formed, on the assumption that, yes, everybody wanted it. And yes, there was all sorts of, there was, everybody liked the idea. All of the, I mean, my colleague, um, principles, they all like the idea. But when it came down to discussing how the business would be dealt with, they saw the open campus as a competitor that would take away the little advances they had made with trying to create online courses. 
not looking at the university's vision, that if they contributed to it and the, the Coburn campus, campus could have taken their contributions much further for them and actually helped to create the course, even more courses than they wanted because of the specialized nature of the units we had created for technology and for online delivery. You see what I mean? So I think it was a sort of a short-sightedness. I don't know that prior to, I was a dean then, I can only reflect on what happened at the academic board. And I, when I would see what happened afterwards, in retrospect, I'm saying, you know, if they had chosen to ask more questions of Lawrence Carrington and so on, maybe then principals and deans and so on would have had a better understanding of what was required. Then when the administration created the, the committee to try and look at those guidelines and try and get people to overcome those little um, niggling issues that they had, they didn't want to do this because it would open campus would take away all their stuff and take all the money. That's silliness. But look at the broader picture of what else was possible for them. If that had been possible, I think so. But the, by the time Open Campus came into being and the renovations were being made and we had enhanced the learning centers on each campus and were enhancing site uh, centers as well, then they probably thought it was a competitive thing and they needed to then build up their own little ODL systems in their own little campuses, make that grow. So they were putting resources. You think each campus putting more resources into the same thing. If you had put it into one thing, then university would have had a massive, by now far, far, far advanced thing with all of the techies who know all about this, dealing with AI issues and all of that and getting ahead of the game, as well as serving the university. That's my best guess, Veronica. I don't know that it's correct. I don't think it's right necessarily. But in retrospect, I think that is probably my take on it. Yes. Um, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, Prof. Now there, there are some comments in the in the chat, which I will just sort of quickly take a sample of them. Uh, a very enlightening presentation from Prof. Um, good to be reminded of the vision. Um, someone's expressing gratitude. Uh, saying that this is a historical account of the genesis and growth of the UE Global Campus course. Excellent historical presentation. Um, I am grateful for this historical account of the evolution of the GC while working at the Bronx Town Community College in 1994, when UE Diet was established as a first pilot site in Bronx Town and Jamaica, by watching yeah. people from there on, you know? So a, a lot of comments. Um, someone is, is saying yes indeed technology has really facilitated and accelerated the penetration of the online learning across the region first it was satellite technology and since covid internet has internet has been a fillip to the objective um dr slowly thank you principal and uh, thank you, Prof, for an hey, excellent presentation. Charlie, How are you? How are you? I am good. good so good to see you. Yes, 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 yes. I wanted to commend you on an excellent presentation and a journey thank down you. memory lane. Thank I have you. to say, Prof, that uh, listening to your presentation, I suddenly started to feel a part of history in a most profound way that I had never really felt. Um, listening to the your recounting of uh, the mission that Professor Carnton was given to sell this concept of the online. Uh, um, I recall sitting in those rooms, the conference room at Social Welfare, when we debated that matter, and I listened, and I'm like, how far removed are we now? However, I thought, um, having experienced the COVID-19 phenomenon, one wonders what would have happened with you had we not taken that plunge 11 years ago yeah. because we were able to just transition and it was this kind of um, experience that we would have had for all of 11 years. Yeah. And, you know, it caused me to really reflect on how things change and how when you have a vision, how you have to sell it to others because it is now so matter of fact that you yeah. want what is it that Professor Carrington had to convince others about 
But like you, I believe that at the time, persons saw it as one campus competing against another. Mm -hmm. But then hindsight is twenty twenty, so it is good to just hear how um, the evolution. In one hour, it appeared quite lengthy. So I understood that you have actually taken an hour to present a 75-year history mm -hmm. from extramural through UIDITE, open and now global. And I really thought that I wanted to just give my own personal commendation for an excellent presentation. It would have taken us days to read all of the material that you have just so condensed. And I was actually feeling a part of that history. So thanks again for that experience, bro. Thank you, Sharon. Next time you come, yes. don't forget to hear me. <laughs> yes, I will. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Yes. Um. So you felt a pang of, well, not a pang, but, but, but you felt a, a sensibility of nostalgia, Dr. Oh, S yes, Dr. Sully, absolutely. So. Uh, <laughs> and, and don't emphasize it too much because we don't want to date yeah. ourselves. Yeah? It's age, exactly. Yeah, I, I tell you. Oh, my God, I'm listening but, to but, this. But the, the, halcyon, the halcyon days. And, and yes. as you say, so, um, you know, Prof, someone is, is saying, have we been able to find a metric to quantify the educational impact of the open campus on learning in the various countries in the region. I, I want your, 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 your view on, on that. Metric is a very scientific word, and I'm not too sure the, the, the person is using it in a very strict sense. But let me hear from you, um, Prof. It presupposes that I would be knowing everything that's happening in the high school. <laughs> I think there are ways of doing it. You can look at um, <clears throat> the figures coming out of what's happening within the formal system in the school. Look at what's happening in NGOs. Look at what's happening within community groups. And for example, um, you can I can think of, well, I think of one who is an autodidact. Actually, this person um, couldn't do things in school, but actually in his community and responding to community. There are people who respond to things in the community and actually seek information from, you know, what maybe extramural or others have to offer. And they actually become very, very important contributors to making life better in the community. So what would have what would need to happen? Here is a great research project pro pro project for somebody who wants to do another PhD in open campus or for you to direct your students to do that kind of comparative thing for some, it's it's going to be too vast, too big for doing across everything. But if you have a series of students doing a series of studies for the open campus, looking at what are the particular uh, variables that actually come into play and how are these used based on what you know exists already through the um, establishment of the open campus in terms of the centers and formal setting as well as what else exists in terms of government support of education. You should get a very excellent, very exciting set of studies that would inform the entire university on what's happening because it's a mission that the open campus can fulfill. Other, if I were just doing applied linguistics, I, you know, um, the, some of my students would go do certain things, but if you have a focus, way of asking the questions that you want to answer and then you go and do a good research project on it with students doing it i'm sure that's a contribution that you could make you would have to determine what the metrics are you would have to set up what the variables are and that history looking at what the vision was and what was established and what they have contributed so far will give you at least a starting point for starting to determine the areas you're going to look at and so if you have people like Dr. Meeks Gardner, who would be able to talk about the actual kinds of designs that you could use for studies of that nature, okay, in your research your research programs. It's something you all can certainly pursue. Um, I know staff of Open Campus is busy, but you can guide your students to doing it. I know this, we have put out more PhD students, and I'm sure more are going to come to you. You can suggest to them that when whichever island they come from, these are things that they can do. And um, you can have it organized through your research report. Very, very, very important challenge um, for us. And, and I like the idea of our graduate students taking this on. In fact, what I was going to say before I call on you, 
and Professor Harris is, look, this book that you put it from, Beyond the Wall, is um, by our former, yeah. you know, this is a, a, a good foundation study, all right, that, that, that can guide us uh, where we go. But I'll tell you something, at a lecture last night, um, which Professor, which Doctor, and people have been calling her Professor, Dr. Nicole Philip Dow, yes, we declare it, um, delivered on the Grenada Revolution. Afterwards, you know, people mingled and so on. And a, a gentleman, must, have, must be in his 50s, he came with pictures of himself and his colleagues, you know, just old, old time photographs. You could see they were sort of shop one. Um, and, and he also came with a certificate that he said he got from the School of Continuing Studies in Grenada. It was something to do with agriculture. And the gentleman yes. told me, and I felt so good about that. The gentleman told me, you know, the School of Continuing Studies has done so well, so much work for us in the region. He came yes. with, so he, this lecture is taking place. He comes with a folder to show us, you know, and it was just amazing. The certificate, I should have taken a, a, a photo of it. And you could see the brown edges as well. It's an old certificate, you know. I mean, if, and so anecdotally, and that is why I think we need to do a lot of qualitative research. Anecdotally, I always speak of people who I knew, you know, and I mean, when you talk about poverty, single parents who were, you know, teachers earning nothing, really. And I saw them with the naked eye do the B.Ed., then the yes. M.Ed., yes. you know, and, and becoming principal. So I saw that in the, with the naked eye. And a lot of times, and I'm happy that I, as principal today, understand what happens and what it means in the smaller jurisdictions, because the multiplier effect of educating one person is, it, it is so enormous in a smaller country because it means that granny gets something from it. Um, grandpa gets something from it. And so on, because the increase in learning helps that. So all of these things, um, Winston, who asked the question, you know, it is just an amazing thing. Yes. Um, Prof. Harris. Uh, yes, thank you. I, the one crude measure that one could possibly look at, and I believe was true, was the number of degrees being granted by that open campus entity, certainly over the first uh, few years, because as I remember it, uh, the number of degrees being granted had gone up into the many hundreds yeah. and uh i'm not sure what they might have been before but i think there was definitely an increase there and also in the total number of students doing courses there were measures of this yeah. there were several thousand students not only doing degree courses but other courses and that was measured and the other thing i wanted to measure and wanted to mention and uh, Prof. Hazel, I know thanks to you, the infrastructure of some of the units. Uh, you spoke about 40 something uh, places <laughs> where <laughs> students were being. Some of them were in horrific state. I remember Jamaica <laughs> yeah. saying people climbing up steps to peep yeah. into craters and so on. We changed. So, there, so there was certainly an expansion in infrastructure. Uh, new places being built in Trinidad, in some yes. of the other countries, and so on. So that could be some of the metric, some of the yes. metrics that one might refer to. Right. But, but, but the numbers are staggering. If I may, um, um, Chair, if I may. Principal? Definitely. Yes. Definitely. For example, your, your you, you, you can <laughs> see, for example, um, the numbers were very, very impressive so you the range of average age of graduates 
all the way up from 25 to 44. More people getting first card. I mean, the, the, we have a, a list of people from the first, for just two two years, 2012 and 13, that we have. Um, <clears throat> but starting off, we, we saw the numbers go up, 25,000 people um, coming to open campus through all of the ways that, that, that we were um, accepting them. Some through the prior learning at the time, which was really, really driven by Deputy Principal Roberts and really making inroads in that way. So first class on the 78, total student graduates, 643 in just that year. Well, you see what I mean? So we have numbers, we have figures for some of those, but that was in the report um, that we did in 2013. So I don't know if other reports actually present all of that information, but there you can start and do that comparison, um, Prof. Harris, to begin to see the growth or the decline and then begin to act on, you know, this this gives you huh, some idea, metric if you like, so that you can begin to see, okay, well, we do have a decline in this area or that area, what do we need to do? And then you plan that way to, to make changes. So I think these reports and just looking at those numbers year by year really would help helps any organization, in fact, to keep its uh, some fingers on the, 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 the steering wheel and to, to make things go. So I was just reading you from the report, um, giving you examples yeah. from the report this year. And, and Prof, don't be demeaned. Um, you did an excellent um, publication. I think it was called the first five years, something to that effect. Yes, 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 that's yes. it. That's the report, so, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, and I think there was a big report, the BFAT D. Yes, report. that we know, did. I mean, this was something else. So there, there's a lot of information. You know, I, I, I think our, I, I think the flaw, you know, is that we have not been able to tell our story. Um, we have perhaps not been given the opportunity to tell our. Our story. I, I think, and, and that is tragic, the ignorance <laughs> about what we do and the impact is, is still is, is still very much prevalent. I, I have to say that we have we have made some in inroads for little, but there is a Caribbean sort of ethnocentrism that tends to choke any attempt of cultural relativity to understand living in one jurisdiction that an impact in St. Lucia, for instance, or Dominica, or, or Grenada, it, it's, it's not, it, it's an impact that is disproportionate to size given the population really. And if you were to do a map of impact, you may very well, in the in terms of the countries we serve, find an enormous impact that is disproportionate to the size, so to speak, of yeah. the <laughs> global campus. And, and that's yeah. why it is not only a matter of figures yeah. and, 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 and quantitative measures, it is qualitative as well. And uh, it is frustrating for me that in in a in a in a in a place of educated people that we miss that point over and over again. We have to be more open-minded in order to understand that impact. Okay. Yes. And yeah. I think um, and maybe it's a conversation I can have with you. Uh, Yes, I, I, I. Not that part about. I'm talking about the willingness for mm -hmm. su support for an open campus, and the promises that were made initially. Yes. So these are things that open campus can follow on, because the fact he was very interested in mm -hmm. supporting some specific things in the campus. So yeah. I'm just saying all of the uh, where we've gone, where you're going, is something that could attract people as well to come back and you know. Yes. So let's not forget that. Yes. And, and a very a very interesting point here. We must also look at the expansion on the lower age range as well. Increasing yes. numbers of younger students who opt to join the campus straight out of high school or coming to college as digital natives 
these students take very easily to online learning. In fact, yes. the, the students who, who start with the open campus uh, in their respective um, jurisdictions, say they migrate to Mona or St. Augustine, mm -hmm. they are often taken aback by the regimented yes, I heard that. classrooms and so on. So, so they want online. Yes. And that's yes. another effect of COVID. You know, yes. even staff <laughs> want to work remotely, but that's, another, that's for another day. I see our deputy principal wants to say something. Uh, a very pleasant good evening to everyone, um, to our Hi, Emily. Hazel, how are you? How are you? I haven't seen you in 20 years. <laughs> well, we, we, we need to talk. Um, you're, I've, I've been very quiet because you ra you have raised some very, very um, serious issues. Uh, I love that synchronized swimming imagery because <laughs> it, it, it really gets to the heart of the issue. And I think that the 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 issue of collaboration remains a very serious problem. However, I like that you know both you and former Vice Chancellor Harris have said it, and our principal as well, that indeed there is as as your entire um conversation has guided us. This is not an enterprise that is going to go away. It is a very critical enterprise for the development of our region. I have many stories to tell when starting from KFL when I was deputy dean for distance and outreach faculty of social sciences, when I really understood what that distance program was doing as before there was a campus, an open campus. When I understood what that distance program was doing, I had friends who thought that they could never get a degree. And when I saw what was possible, I introduced them and they have all graduated, um, people running their own businesses, um, and and the when we talk about impact, we as as Principal Severin has said, we really need to do these qualitative studies um, to really look at both numbers as well as as the qualitative impact. Like now, I have a friend who just got; she was first in one of these postgraduate um, PhD presentations, oral presentations. She came; she got a first, and this is a woman who left school with just three passes and a son. And she went, she, she re, after about maybe seven years after leaving school, she went through the School of Continuing Studies, did her stuff, blah, 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 came all the way through. When she was able to matriculate, she went to St. Augustine campus, did her first degree, did her master's, became a, an MP in Trinidad and Tobago, as well as a minister in the in Ministry of Social Development, and now finishing her PhD. So they did what we have, what we do, and what we continue to do is critical and important to the most vulner vulnerable, some, sometimes even marginalized. And this is in Trinidad and Barbados, my stories are. So it's not just the smaller territories, it's the periphery and not physical periphery alone. Yeah, It's the people who are on the margins of society in some situations who get their second, third, and fourth chances through this campus, and that's something we must never lose. <clears throat> but in terms of the, 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 you raise something that is very, very, very important. And as I told the principal, and I'm going to speak plainly here, I told him in a WhatsApp chat, I do not think that we can actually discuss the heart of the problem in this conversation. We actually have to have um, separate conversations on that particular, those particular issues, because that issue of getting that synchronization across the UV remains yes. a very, very deep problem. Yes. And it is a very troubling problem. And I, I like what you said about the, the notion of global versus open. It remains a deep concern of mine in terms of how we navigate that. But I'm a, I'm, I am an eternal optimist. And so we are looking for ways to, you know, really ensure that the purpose, that deep purpose that you have listed so well, that 
that you have so carefully taken, taken us through today, that deep purpose for this enterprise, that it remains and it remains and it, it I should say, flourishes successfully. So it would be good to hear about the partnerships and so on that are still possible yes. because um, that is really the focus. So I want to say thanks again, Hazel. Always okay. great to hear from you. Thanks, um, Emily. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, well I said, I don't know whether, um, Prof, you want to comment? Or... No, no, I think ev everybody's on board. So I, I think you all are, you know, all aware of very whatever. So I just want to say thank you for, it just makes me a little bit nostalgic too, you know, because yes. of the kinds of discussion, but thank you for inviting me and I'm honored. And please, let me, I could see so many of you again, even though it's on Zoom. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that that leaves me really to really um, extend a, a, a hearty, heartfelt um, thank you to you, Prof, for accepting our our invitation. I I have been as principal very proud of these um, global conversations. Yes. Um, that 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 we have had and. Um, you you are aware that deputy principal um the, the the penultimate one and i'm thinking the richness that has emerged from these two presentations and i'm asking marketing to preserve all of them but certainly in terms of knowing who we are because if, you see you have to know yourselves in order to project that self and, and i think those two last lectures would, would help us um, in, in enormously in our quote unquote public education to the rest in terms of the the impact. I am very, very touched and and and, and warmed by the interaction between a former principal and a former vice chancellor. You know, I mean this this has been so good uh, tonight. Thank you for the challenges that you, you have posed, even in terms of responding to the question on, me, on, on the metrics and, and what our, our research students can do. You know, and, and not only the doctoral students, but those doing the research papers in the, in the MSCs and, and so on. It, there's so many possibilities. So what I'm saying, I suppose, Prof, is that we're asking that you don't go too far away from us. <laughs> Yes, uh, so so that we 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 can touch, reach out and touch you, um, you know, at, at any time. So we we want to really thank you for 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 taking up our invitation. I want to thank the committee, um, for really the ideas and the this the selectees, if you will, of of the global um conversations. I I actually think that. If we did only that for the 75th anniversary, really, we have done very well. It has been a good year. I think it's opportune also to extend for those of you who celebrate it, because I don't think I will get the opportunity again, as time moves very quickly, to extend best wishes um, to each and every one of you, uh, and you in particular, Prof, uh, for the Yuletide um, season that is around the corner. Exactly. So uh, good night to each and every one of you and please be safe. Good night and thanks Francis and everyone and have a wonderful holiday. God yes. bless everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Blessings Thank everyone. You. Have good a night. safe Christmas. Bye-bye. Good night everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Good night everybody.